It's Friday morning. I've just had a very delicious cup of coffee and a brown scone. And while it's hot here, it certainly feels like it's going to rain soon. So this seems like an ideal time to sit down and do June's monthly roundup. Hi everybody, welcome to this monthly roundup video, which I won't lie, is one of my favorite videos to make in a month. And this is the video where I sit down with you and I talk with you about the changes in my board game collection, the games I've acquired, maybe the games I got rid of, things I've been playing and such. So, you know, that we can kind of hang out a little bit together. Um, and I hope you will also tell me what you've been playing as well, what you've been purchasing, what you've been thinking about, you know, a bit of gaming kind of chit chat. I think, think the world needs more um, stuff like this. Um, so yeah, I have a lot of fun making this video. Um, and of course, sometimes I'll chat a little bit just about myself, about you know what the channel is doing and things like that. And if you want to hear those bits and bobs, you can hang around till the end. So June's been an interesting month because um, the world is kind of half going back to normal, or at least sort of. I guess this depends what country you're in. Um, yeah, yeah, it kind of does. Um, here we'll, we'll be allowed to meet people as of Monday, which is two, three days away. Um, and it'll be interesting to meet up and play games after such a long absence. Um, and I don't, I like, I'm not gonna lie, I had a, I had a pretty good quarantine. Um, I enjoyed being able to kind of spend time at home with my husband. It didn't make any real difference to my life that I couldn't go anywhere. Um, so it's odd having everything go back to normal and people be so excited about it when I'm just like, uh, I just have to re readjust, um, as they say. But yeah, you can't change those kind of things, can you? So I'll talk a little bit about games because, you know, games are the, the constant um, in many of our lives. And so I'll start off by talking about the changes in my collection. So these are the, the new titles that have arrived. Um, so let's see what we did this month after last month's kind of crazy amount of games. I think we toned it down a little. I don't know, maybe a little bit. Um, but actually, so the first thing I want to talk about is, um, is something that... I think it's a really, really brilliant idea, but isn't really for me. And this is the Dice and Ink um, Roll and Write Anthology. So you might've seen this about on the internet, maybe you haven't. Here's a copy, see, I, ha I had it ready because I kind of, I really want to show this to you um, because it's, a, look, normally games come in boxes and you can show components and things. It's much harder to show somebody what's in a book. So this is a collection of roll and write games from um, a whole variety of authors. And inside, let's see, can I show you? There's all sorts of different games you can play. Um, and you can pull out the sheets or you can leave them in the book. And there's a whole host of different things. And I just, I think it's such a good idea. Like, roll and write are games you can normally, you know, you just need some dice and some paper and a pen. But the idea of having an entire book with a bunch of them that you could bring places, I think it's fantastic. And because of the nature of the game, where they are on a sheet of paper, I'm amazed no one has done this before. And this is done really, really beautifully. Um, I'm not a big fan of roll and write games as a whole. Um, I think, you know what, I thought, I was thinking about this last night and I was, I was, because this book is beautiful. It just, it makes you want to play games. Like, look at it. It's beautifully colored. Everything's lovely and filled in and kind of ready for you to engage with. I think this is the kind of thing I would love to have if I was traveling. I could imagine doing this like a puzzle book on a train, you know, that kind of thing. Or maybe if you were on holidays to have something to do kind of in the evening, because you can play these on your own or you can play these with other people. Um, and on a whole, I'm really, really impressed with it. So I think if you like roll and write, um, this is worth looking um, looking at really. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm super impressed with that. Um, also, I know the people who put it together and they're wonderful people so you should you should totally look into it if you like roll and rights so um hopefully i'll get to some of them at some point or another but um for now yeah they're just they're kind of fantastic right um do many of you enjoy roll and rights i know they're really really popular at the moment i just can't just get into them i don't know what it is paper and pencil doesn't scream game to me it screams puzzle so that, well, how do you guys feel about them? I know there are some fantastic ones going around at the moment. Um, so yeah, I would love to hear some of your favorite roll and writes. Maybe that will tempt me in um, to try and, and play some more. So that was the, the first arrival of this month. Um, so the second thing on the list, oh, this one's interesting because um, this is a game I didn't want to buy. Um, so yeah, let's just jump right in with it, right? So this is um, Isle of Cats 
from the city of games um, and Isle of Cats has been lauded everywhere as being a fantastic game. People really, really loved it. I saw many photographs of people with cats in the lid of the box because the box says you should put your cat in the lid. Um, which was a really clever marketing ploy, I have to say. It was super, super smart. Um, but it's a game um, about polyonomos. You know those like Tetris style shapes and you have to fit them on a boat. They just happen to be cats. And I'm not a big fan of polyonomos, um, as Uwe Rosenberg has taught me well. Um, and they normally, I don't know, those games are kind of okay here. We play them once, maybe twice, not a lot. So my husband said, you know, he was really interested in getting Isle of Cats and I was against it because I was I was like, I just don't see us playing this repeatedly. You know, maybe, yeah, once it'll be fun when it gets here, but not like long term. And so this debate went on for ages. And then one Friday morning, I woke up and saw that it was on sale. So I was like, here, husband, this is the price of the game if you really want to get it. So we did indeed buy Isle of Cats after all that debacle. So I went in with much trepidation, I ain't gonna lie. I was trying very hard not to be judgmental, but that's difficult when you've already formed an opinion on something you don't really know anything about. Um, and to be sure, um, Isle of Cats is exactly what I imagined it would be. It is fitting sh shapes onto your ship. Um, that was too many S's in a row. Um, but you know what, it's not bad. I won't lie, there's a bit of drafting to it um, and you're scoring different things other than just, you know, the ability to cover up the ship. So I can I can see what the appeal is. It's light and it's fun um, and it's it's pretty entertaining. I like lots of people enjoy it and you know right rightfully so. It doesn't necessarily spark all of my triggers, but um, my other half loved it. So it looks like it's going to stay around for another while. We'll see how many more plays it gets. But um, yeah, I do think it's a nice game. The special thing about it actually is it's ridiculously well produced. Um, for what is essentially a game about fitting Tetris pieces on a board, it is gorgeous. All of the art is lovely. All of the components are lovely. Like the way it's put together is just really, really fantastic. Um, so I can definitely recommend Isle of Cats, even if it isn't for me or necessarily my favorite. <laughs> um, it's not its fault. It's a polyonimo game, I guess. Okay, so what's next? Ah, yes. So this was a, an interesting one. Um, way back many moons ago, when we had a spiel um, last year, um, people were releasing all of their lists of games they were excited to see, right? That was coming out from Essen. Um, and one of those that was mentioned a bit um, was Atlant Dice. But I never heard anything about it after Essen. People were talking about it in the run up to Essen, but never after. And it just seemed like a, a dice placement game. I still can't fully tell you what it's about. Um, but what's it, what is interesting is um, that it also it went on sale a couple of days ago or maybe a week ago for five euros. <laughs> it's very, very cheap for a board game. So we're like, we'd try it for five euros, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd try a game for a fiver, definitely. So we're like, okay, let, well, let, let, let's order Atlantis. The interesting thing was to get free shipping, you had to spend another bit of money. You spend another fiver to get free shipping. So my husband was looking for something to fill in with the fiver um, to get free shipping. And you know what he chose? <laughs> he chose Reavers of Midgar, uh, which is not a five euro game, which is a much bigger euro game. Uh, but I thought it was hilarious that he ordered that just to get free shipping. Um, but that's one we've been kind of trying to trade for as opposed to buy, because I've not played any of the Champions of Midgar, Reavers of Midgar series. Um, but you know, the, the, you'd kind of, kind of like to try them at some point. So um, Atlantis has still not been played yet. It's got a lot of cardboard components inside of the box and not much else and far less dice than I was anticipating. Um, I thought at least, you know, for five euros, I'd be getting a, a bucket of dice, but no, it's a very, very small box. So we'll have to see how that um, turns out. I'll let you know, um, hopefully next month. And then Reavers. So Reavers of Midgar is the second in the series of Champions of Midgar. Um, and the reason we decided to play Reavers first is because I've heard it's more Euro gamey. It's a little longer, a little think here. That sounded kind of what we'd like to do. Um, so I played that twice actually last weekend. Um, and it's an unusual title in the sense that this is a game about Vikings and the stuff Vikings do and why you do them to get victory points. 
Um, but I just, I couldn't wrap my head around why we were, we were doing everything. I was like, so why am I, like the, the board is set up where there's like six different locations or so that you can go. And when you're there, you'll have dice or whatever, and you'll need dice to access certain locations um, and that kind of thing. And I was like, okay, but why are we, why are we doing this? What's the point in doing this, this or this? And my husband, I think was fairly exasperated. He's like, you, you're just doing it for, for victory points. But I'm like, Shouldn't there be some sort of story about why I'm collecting art for victory points? Or, you know, why I'm going to this village? Um, I just, it just didn't click for me. Um, now the game itself, um, I didn't, I suppose I didn't mind it. I found it got very samey really fast. Like we literally, we've only played two games and I, I did the same strategy both times because I couldn't really come up with one that I thought was superior. Um, so yeah, I could like, I can see why, no, I'm not sure if I, well, why would people like it? I'm not entirely sure why people would like it. I think maybe I'm just looking for a bigger game than the game provides. It might be possible because it looks like a, a big game with its fancy custom dice. It's got a beautiful board, some very nice, actually the cards are crap. I've never seen such thin cards in my life. They are shockingly bad, but um, the board and things like that, there are nice components. But I just, I don't know, it didn't, didn't ring any bell for me. Um, if you've played it, I'd love to know what you enjoyed about it. What, what's your favorite part? Because I did like this idea of, I go to this island to get these things, and then I go to this port to get these things so I can go back to the island. But it just seemed a little derivative to me um yeah i don't know so it was like it, that's the problem that's the main reason why we played it twice because when we played it first um we weren't sure if we'd play it again and my husband's like let's play it now while we know what we're doing while we still know the rules and see how we feel about it and we just find ourselves doing the exact same strategies both times maybe that's a two-player issue as we did say this is probably far more interesting with more players because you'll have much more competition for the different spots you can go to um, and it really does have that nice mechanic actually of where where someone else does an action you also get to perform the action too so that's pretty cool so maybe it's just a case of it needs more than just two hmm could be the case i don't know i don't know i wasn't feeling it anyway so that's reavers of midgar okay what is next Haha, -ha. so this is something I actually wanted. <laughs> I've actually wanted for a really long time. Um, I wanted it actually way back when it was on Kickstarter and too expensive. And this is Brass Lancashire with the Iron Clays. This is the important feature, the Iron Clays. Um, if you guys haven't seen these, these are phenomenal. So Roxley Games makes these, they're basically poker chips, but they're really, really heavy poker chips. They're made out of clay, I assume, iron clays, clays and iron, I don't know. Um, but they are beautiful. Um, they're so much fun to hold in your hand. We've been using them as coins in games and in other games instead. They came in this beautiful tray. So this was all part of kind of the Kickstarter version of Brass. So we have had the other version of Brass and I like to get them confused between, because there's Birmingham and there's Lancashire. And we've had one for longer than the other. The one that doesn't have the brooding man on the cover. So I want to say Birmingham. Um, so we've had that one for a bit and I quite liked Brass. I'd like to play more of it. It was one of, one of those. So we finally played Brass, think about this, Lancashire, the one with the brooding man with the top hat on the cover um, at the weekend. And I really, I re well, I really enjoyed it. Um, I was a little confused for a small amount of time because it's an unusual game because it, well, they're, they're both, they're both roughly the same game with small differences. They're just different maps. And what it, this game is about is making money in the industrial revolution in England. Um, and so, you know, you're trying to get coal and iron to be able to build other things to get the victory points. Um, it's got some very cool mechanisms. I like how it works. It's actually very straightforward of a game. I, Despite being highly rated complexity wise on Board Game Geek, um, like it's, very, it's pretty straightforward. Maybe they're thinking in terms of how many strategies you could employ, I don't know. Um, but when we sat down to play it, everything was connected, right? So you would need coal to do this, you would need iron to build this, you would get the cotton from this building to do this. And then there were boats. And I was convinced that boats should probably Probably take your goods somewhere because that's normally what a boat would do um, and boats are very expensive and big things to build so me being me the first couple of turns I'm like right I'm building a boat and um, so I build a boat and um, my husband goes well don't you've built a boat and I'm like but what now don't I use the boat to ship things he's like no 
No, the boat, and I'm like, well, what's the boat for then? Because everything else in the game is connected. You use this to do this, this to do this. I was really disappointed to discover the boat had like no value except victory points. So um, that's the lesson I learned from Brass, is that boats apparently have no, you just, they don't even help you ship your goods. So yeah, that was, that was my experience of Brass. But I'm really happy we finally got a copy and we got one with the clays. And the very interesting part is this is, I think, the first board game we've ever bought from eBay. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys tried that before. Um, this is first game. It was it came sealed with the clays. It was posted up on eBay and we bidded for it. Woo! We didn't even buy it straight out. So it got very exciting. We had reminders set, you know, like a couple of minutes before it was due to go off. My husband was doing some sort of bidding shenanigans where he was trying to scare other bidders off. And it works. I didn't believe it was going to work. So we got we got it for a really, really good price. Um, as much as we probably would have paid for it secondhand without the clays. So uh, that was fantastic news. I think we would try that again. That was such a positive experience. Um, so that was all the excitement um, around Brass. So yeah, I, I, I like Brass a lot to me, to be fair. That's a really good game. I want to play more of it now at the weekend while I know that boats are only good for victory points. Okay, so what are we getting down to? Okay, so we're down to the last little bits of the purchases. Um, so this comes with a bit of sadness actually a lot of sadness because um i live in cork in ireland hurrah hoop hip hooray and in our city of cork we had a tabletop gaming cafe and i think it was the first one in ireland and we did our best to kind of help support it locally we used to go in and play games there they had a library that some really nice food and we would buy board games in the shop um and because of the covid kind of situation they've been closed now for over three months and it's looking like they won't be able to reopen. So during the week, they announced that they were going to be closing the store um, and selling off their ex kind of library stock, you know, that they had from their, their games library. And on the one hand, that's, I, I'm really going to miss it. I think the, like, that was something really special to have in Cork and it was really nice to have as a gamer and as a great way of introducing people to the hobby. You know, people who just might wander in off the street and try some of the games. Um, I think that's really, really sad, but them selling off their stock meant they were selling cheap board games. So this was yesterday. And so we decided um, that we would go and queue and see could we get some good board games. Well, actually, my husband decided because I don't leave the house all that often. Um, so he left his work yesterday early at lunchtime and he got there about half an hour before the shop opened and the queue was all the way around the corner, all the way around the street. And he queued for half an hour and he still didn't get it inside the door. Um, so we had to go, had to go back to work. So that was that was the end of that. But then, um, unbeknownst to me, he came home with three board games. And I'm like, how did you do that? So apparently he rang them up in the afternoon to see had they anything left. And they only had three games and he brought them home. So I was like, okay, I suppose they're, they're better here than anywhere else. <laughs> Um, and so at least, at least some of these are, are, are nice. And the first one I'm going to talk about is New York Slice. Um, so this is the game that comes in a pizza box, woo, where you're building a pizza and trying to get the best portion of it, you know, for yourself to score points. Um, yes, the game looks like pizza. Um, we've played it before only once and we played it in tabletop um, a long time ago. Um, so that should be kind of fun or cool to, to see how we get on with that. It's definitely more of a people game than we are, um, but no harm with that. The second thing we picked up and I was surprised by this is Cottage Garden. Um, so this is a Uwe Rosenberg title, I believe. It's definitely one of his, it's a polyomino game. I'm like, why? Um, and I have played this one before. Um, so I'm not sure why we have this. Maybe it's for trading fodder. Um, and the last game is one I actually would have wanted because I've been wanting to try this for ages. And this is Biblios. So Biblios is the, the dice placement -y game. It's a small little thing. Um, lots of people praise it as good, good stuffs. And I've just never got around to picking up a copy. So th that's the one I'm excited to have seen and heard of. Um, so yeah, so we did pick up a number of games this month, kind of accidentally or on purpose. Um, not entirely sure, but they've been unusual as in there's been very few kind of standouts out of the lot. But that does seem to be the way of new games for us at the moment anyway. And we've, we're shrinking our collection quite significantly as in like we've gaps in our collect shelves right now, which is very unusual for us. 
So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with that. Um, I have two more games that arrived and these are review copies. So you'll be hearing more about these and in depth soon. Um, and the first one I've been holding you on tenter hooks about because last month while I was filming this video, I got a text message that said I had a package coming for delivery and I didn't know what it was. Well, here's the answer if you waited an entire month to find out. And this is Adventure Mart from Hub Games. And Adventure Mart is an absolutely adorable game where you are a shopkeeper and you're trying to make a sale to certain adventurers to try and make yourself the best shopkeeper of the day. Um, it's cute, it's family friendly, it's nice and light and it always makes me smile. Um, and yeah, so that's been that's been really, really fun. Um, so yeah, the review for coming that coming for that soon. And the other thing that arrived um, is Popper's Ladder. Um, so this um, is from a guy, Mr. Stapleton. <laughs> I was like, I was gonna look at the, look for the box because the box is normally sitting up here. Um, and it basically is kind of a, it seems like a fantasy game. I've just unboxed it, right? And the reason I chose this game is mostly because it's got a magpie on the cover um, and it's very pretty looking, it's very arresting. Um, and inside there is a ton of cards, there is a board with places I think we're gonna place these cards on and there are items and quests and things like that to do. So it seems like kind of a big kind of adventure game um, that's really, really pretty and bright and colorful. So I'm looking forward to playing a few games of that. Um, so yeah, so those are the two review copies. So yeah, more and more from those eventually and hopefully soon. Um, yeah, and I'd really like to know, I suppose, what you guys have been playing. What's hitting your tables this month? Did you get anything new or exciting? Um, or is there anything you'd like to pick up? Is anyone interested in the Terraforming Mars big box Kickstarter thing that's going on? It's tearing our household apart. Um, <laughs> Because yes, it's more Terraforming Mars stuff, but it's not really new content. So it's very difficult for us to decide whether this is worth investing kind of all our, uh, investing our money into for some time, despite really, really loving Terraforming Mars. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear your opinion on, on that. Like, do you love a game so much that you buy everything that goes with it? Has anybody else done that kind of fandom? Because um, I feel a little bit like that about the Emperor S4 titles, like a new one comes out and it won't matter what it was about, I still want to, to own it and play it. You know, that way I wouldn't be turned off. Um, but I'm not I'm not sure if my husband's got the fandom and he is the Terraform Rumors fan. So yeah, I'd like to be convinced one way or the other. If you've got a good argument, I'd, I'd love to know it. I, I want to solve this debacle. Um, okay, cool. So let's move on to the next section, which would normally be trades. But there have been some trades, but they haven't arrived yet. So I'll probably tell you about them next month because I don't believe a trade has really happened till the game actually arrives here. Um, but it's looking like we managed to trade away our copy of La Stanza, which would be like the highlight of my year. It's the game I just couldn't get rid of. Um, and it was such a big hype um, at Essen last year when we bought it. Um, it was such a crappy game. So it's been lovely. We we'll see if someone see if someone's actually willing to take it from us. Uh, would be fantastic. So I'll, I'll report back about those next month. So we'll go right into the games that I've been playing. Okay, so in this new spirit of games I've been playing, I'm going to talk to you about the games I've played that arrived last month that you didn't get to hear about just yet. Um, and so the first of these is Scoville, and this is from Tasty Minstrel Games, and it is indeed a game about growing peppers. And when I first talked to you about it, I didn't know a whole lot more than that. Well, I've since played it, um, so I can come back with a little bit of feedback for you um, and tell you I loved it. Um, really, really happy with this game. Um, so how Scoville um, works is, yes, you're trying to um, grow peppers, but you're also trying to breed them through cross-pollination. So that means that you've got basically a little board in which everyone shares. And as you walk around, you can combine peppers of different colors to make a pepper of a new color. So if you combine, I'm gonna, whatever color I say here is gonna be wrong, a blue and a red pepper, you can make a purple pepper. Um, woo! Um, and so there are quests that require peppers of different colors for you to hand in, fair enough. And there are rewards for being the first one to create peppers of particular colors. Um, and you get basically 
need like a little um, player rate that has a grid on it to show you, you know, which peppers combine with which to make what colors. And the minute we started playing it, um, the first thing I noticed is the little pepper tokens. Um, and these are like little plastic, tiny chilies, and they're obviously different colors for the different color peppers. The best part is the ghost pepper. The ghost pepper is huge, but it's also see-through and sparkly. And I was determined that I would make a ghost pepper and make ghost pepper pepper I did. Um, but the the hard part you see about making these is that you can only walk particular ways in the path in your garden so you can't go backwards right so you have to, and you only have so many steps you can go so you have to plan out exactly how many peppers you can cross to get to the pepper you wanted um, and I think that's kind of the real the real puzzle here it's, a, it's not a particularly complicated game but it was one I had lots of fun figuring out um, we played it at two and I'd heard mixed um, reports, I suppose, about some people said it was better with more players if you want to player interaction. Some people said it was crap at two just for that reason. And some people said it was great at two because, you know, you could just do your own thing. Um, we very much did our own thing. Um, we kind of had our own farms and things like that. And it worked out perfectly fine. Um, I really, really liked it. I cannot wait to play more of it. It's a very different game than um, than others. And I, I love when a game just does its own thing. This is the Scoville thing. Um, and it, it feels just like, I don't know, just like it should, something different. So um, I really like that. And I'm looking forward to playing more of it. So that is Scoville. Spicy meatball. Okay, so... Next up on the list is Majolica. Um, so I've only played this once, played this, played this once. So it's still, um, I need, obviously I need to play it more, but I'll give you a kind of a first impressions. Um, Majolica is a tile laying game. Um, it would remind you of Azola a little bit in the sense that there are tiles in the middle of the board that you're going to take and put onto your board. Um, they're in different colors and patterns. But the difference here is that you've got a workshop with four different sections in it. And each section has kind of a goal that needs to be achieved with the colors you take. So like it'll say you need to have four green tiles in this section. And when you fill that in, any remaining tiles in your workshop get moved to the next workshop over and they can be used to fill in the next kind of goal that you have going. Um, so you can kind of combo them together if you plan it correctly. Um, but also it's essentially like a moving puzzle you're trying to see where things are going to end up at the um eventually you know you know the kind of way um so i really quite liked that it was very chill um i like like the pieces the tiles in it are quite thin they feel like tile and i think i think the problem is the minute you play this you're going to compare it to azul because they're similar kind of in theme and this doesn't have the same kind of components but I don't think it makes it any less of a game I just think it's kind of a misfortunate that it hasn't come to light before now um yeah it's very pretty it's very fun it's a different type of puzzle than as all despite also just dealing with putting tiles in the right locations um but I liked it quite a bit it was it was nice um I'm, I'm glad I, I got to try it and I want to play more of it as well so that is Majolica um what is next Okay, I'll talk about Key Market before I get to Puerto Rico because that's going to be a bit of a rant. Um, so I got the expansion the for Key Flower, the, key, the market expansion. Um, as some of you know, I'm a big fan of Key Flower. Um, there is a review for that coming soon. It's already filmed and ready to go. I just need an intro video. So we'll get to that part. Um, so if you haven't heard about Key Flower, your chance to know more is coming soon. And I feel like I actually have got all the expansions now. So I had the farmer's one, which gave us the kind of pigs and sheep meeples and you had to fit them in enclosures. And I quite like that actually. Um, I didn't like too much on its own. I think it would be better mixed in with the base game, but you, I think you can kind of play it nearly by itself. With, um, and then this new market expansion added in a whole host of other things like kind of end game scoring things, um, pieces, things you could score or complete during the game for bonuses. Um, I felt like there was a lot going on, like it was just too much that you wouldn't need to play with all of these extras at once. Um, but I always think, I suppose, more of the same type of content is good in an expansion for a game. So I definitely wouldn't like turn it down or anything like that. It just felt like, wow, this needs to be diluted a little bit. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, we can do this and there's this, this, there's five whole new things to do that really you only want, you know, one or two more to be doing at any one time. Um, but it was interesting nonetheless. Somebody had a lot of ideas, I think, when they put it together. Um, so that was the expansion for Keyflower, the markets. 
Um, and finally, I'm going to talk about Puerto Rico. And this is the game that's cost me a lot of hassle this week. Um, it's, I think it was the last to get played because it's a, one of these numbered games and automatically we put it in with the other number titles. So it got forgotten about as a new game. <laughs> Normally they sit in the stack together until we've played them and then they get moved into the collection. But um, Puerto Rico got promoted by accident. Um, so we sat down to play Puerto Rico at the weekend and I've played San Juan, which is apparently the card game of Puerto Rico, quite a bit. So the game felt familiar from the get-go and... Oh God. So this is a game um, basically where you are a colonist on an island. Um, the, well, the island of San Juan, San Juan of Puerto Rico. Um, and you um, are putting out farms in the fields, you're creating buildings, and then you're shipping away the goods to make profits. Hmm. Yes. Um, so colonialism really is the main theme here, um, unnecessarily so. And the problem I suppose I have with this game is, well, first off, we're just taking over somebody else's island, taking their stuff and shipping it away, you know, to win. Um, and I'm not very comfortable with that. I think it's something very weird about it, to be honest. And then it got worse because as you put um, all the kind of, all the little buildings out and all the people working out in the fields, they're these brown little discs. And I'm sitting here as a white person watching myself put out all these brown discs on the board to labor for me so that I can make money and win the game. And it, I just got more uncomfortable the longer we played it. And inevitably, of course, I won. And I, and I sat there and I'm like, I'm the best white colonialist in the house. Um, and it really bothered me. It really upset me. I just, I don't understand why this game had to be about something like that because the problem with games like this is that you're only telling one side of the story. Colonialism didn't just magically happen where someone walked into another place and just took all their stuff and nobody died or was upset about it. Um, and it's, I'm amazed that games are made about this type of theme. Um, and I'm in the process of trying to understand a little bit more about board games and colonialism because this isn't the first time this has happened, right? There's a whole host of games where we have these kind of issues. Like in Santa Maria, you're like converting the, the locals to Christianity and they get smiley happy face tokens when you do, which is really, really weird. Um, I know there are issues with Maracaibo, which only came out last year. Mombasa is another one with slaves. And my copy of Five Tribes is the first edition and it has slave cards in it that you sacrifice to the gods um and I just I'm like why would why would this be why would this be there why is this necessary why is this something that you know we're kind of glorifying in our games um I haven't fully articulated my points about this yet or why I feel so terrible playing these kinds of games as I do um, I'm doing some research. I've reached out on the internet for research and I'm in the process of reading a couple of articles and they're helping me a little bit. Um, cause you know, when you feel something was wrong, but you can't like, how, you're like, how do I say this articulately? So I'm working on that, but it's something I think you should, you should think about, you know, is it more important that your game is fun? Because Puerto Rico is a great game. Don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed it. It was fantastic. It just made me very uncomfortable to play it. Um, and I don't know if this happens to other people. Some people are like, well, this is just history. This is how it was. Well, that isn't how history was because people died for these things to happen. You know, it's, it wasn't this lovely magical takeover where merchants were, you know, so where merchants could just show up and make money and not worry and the indigenous people were completely fine with it. Um, so there's more sides to be told here and this isn't, I suppose, the only game that's made me feel this way. But it, it's hard because Puerto Rico is so popular for a start. It's also because it's, it's a good game. Um, but I just, yeah, I can't feel comfortable playing a game like that. So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. How do you feel about the games that basically only telling one side of history or just using history as a backdrop without actually paying any attention to, you know, what actually happened? Um, if you have any more examples or any kind of literature or stuff that you think I should have a look at, I'd really love to hear from that. I'm going to put together a blog post with a list of kind of resources I found if anyone wants to like read a little bit more into it um so yeah so that's that that was my uncomfortable feelings from gaming this month um yeah so what have you been playing please tell me it was more cheery than that um 
you know, because <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. So yeah, let's hear what let's hear what's been on your table, um, and what's been your your favorite thing you played this month. Right. Let's move on to the last section. So this last section is probably going to be pretty short this month. Maybe that's a positive thing. Um, but I suppose I just feel like there, there isn't a whole lot of stuff going on around here. I'm just, I'm working away things as always. I have a number of review copies I'm working my way through. Um, and I'm trying to kind of, I don't know, settle myself into ev everything. Um, this new studio has been fantastic. Um, still feels like a little bit of a box of misery. Um, and the reasoning behind that is I just, I don't accept good things for myself very well. So every time I step in here, it's like a whole, here's a whole room of good stuff that happened to you. And I just, it goes the opposite way. It just makes me a little bit miserable instead. Because it, I don't know, it's hard to believe I deserve nice things. Yeah, I know, you've heard all this from me before. You don't need me kind of going into <laughs> my mental health and whatnot. But um, yeah, I think it's been a good month. I've, I've been able to make things, been able to put things out. Um, I've done some learning of things too. I'm keeping that up. Um, and I'm trying to pace myself nicely so that I don't get overwhelmed. So I had a video almost ready to put out this week, but it wasn't entirely ready and I was too tired to manage to finish it. So I've just said I'll wait till next week. This might sound like a simple thing. It's a new concept to me. Um, in the same way, new concept is that, you know, I can record whenever I feel like. It doesn't have to be this big dramatic thing like it normally is. It, it occurred to me today, I don't have to record in the morning. I could record in the afternoon. I've never done that before. I let, <laughs> I'm kind of I'm kind of set in my ways, but still, it's it's been good. Um, yeah, th this month as a whole, I think has been good. Um, I'm tired. It's been a lot of work, but it's been great. Um, as always, I want to give a shout out to the Tabletop Inquisition podcast. Woohoo! If you haven't listened to it, why not? It's it's really good. You definitely should. Um, and there'll be a new episode coming out. Actually, it'll be out. It'll be out on the Monday um, when this gets released on Wednesday. So um, you should go and check it out. We have a, a website if you want to find us there or on other things. And this episode, if I remember, is talking about our favorite filler games and our favorite longer games. So that could be interesting to hear. Um, I know we had fun making it. That's the best part. So yeah, um, every, yeah, that does. <laughs> I, you know what? I think I have nothing to say. So I'm probably going to just let you guys get on with it. Why don't you guys do the talking for a change? Tell me how your month has been. I'd love, I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you. I love hearing other people's stories because my world is so insular. It's great hearing from the outsides, um, for sure. But no, it's been a good, a good month. Got to play plenty of games and managing to keep on top of my videos and my work and stuff like that. Um, and that in itself is like a blessing. So I'm going to take it as it is. Um, in other notes, I miss Spiel. <laughs> as you all know, Spiel um, for Essen this year has been cancelled. Every so often I am reminded that I don't get to go to Spiel this year because that was, I suppose that was our holiday. And um, we saved up a bunch of money to try and be able to go. And every so often I just remember that it's not going to happen. And it makes me a little sad inside. Um, so I guess I'm wondering, are you missing any events too? What would have been your um, kind of convention to go to for the year? Um, or if you're not really a convention goer, which one do you think sounds the most interesting? Which one would you like to try? Um, that'd be interesting. Maybe we can all console each other just a little bit about the lack of that. Um, okay, so I'll keep it short and sweet. And I will talk to you again next month. Um, be sure to tune in for more well, short and informative board game reviews. Uh, that's my new shtick. Um, but also, yeah, come say hi on Twitter. Um, for those of you who don't know, I actually have a Facebook page as well, if anyone wants to pop in there. I'm trying very hard to create discussions and you can look at memes I put out every day. Um, and yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Social media, say hello. Okay, cool. I'll talk to you next time, everybody. Take care and bye-bye.